today in nerd history. Storytelling in video games is stronger than it's ever been, but for every Naughty Dog game or Bioware RPG, there's about 10 dozen games that are kind of lacking in the story department. Even still, some of these games can be hiding incredible gems in their backstories. Here are five games with incredible hidden backstories. Number one, every Doom game is just one big interconnected story. The Doom series is one of my favorites, don't get me wrong, it's great, but it's also not one that's really known for its stories. In fact, id Software developer John Carmack is famously quoted as saying, Story in a game is like story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not that important. And the latest entry of the series literally features the main character punching the plot out of the way in the first five minutes of the game. But just because it's maybe not immediately visible to the player, me, and you, and probably a bunch of other people, it doesn't mean that the story's not there. If you look past the ever-growing mountain of demon carcasses, you'll find that every Doom game, including the reboot, is part of an ongoing timeline. I know what you're thinking. Uh, Tony, now, isn't each Doom game except for 2 and 64 essentially the same backstory, you know, with the Martian demon invasion and everything? Well, okay, first of all, no. Second of all, please stop interrupting, it hurts my feelings. The original Doom follows the humble space marine to Phobos, one of Mars's moons, after a teleportation experiment by the Union Aerospace Corporation accidentally rips open a goatsy sized portal to hell. After ripping and tearing his way through the Martian moon monsters, he heads home to Earth to stop a demonic invasion in Doom 2. And many people think that this is where the storyline for the original series ends, not realizing that the Nintendo 64 exclusive Doom 64 actually picks up exactly where Doom 2 leaves off. And in that game, featuring the metalist ending of all time, the Doom Marine decides to stay in hell indefinitely to indulge in his favorite pastime of straight-up, stone-cold murdering demons forever. Doom 3 marks a stark departure from the series, visually and tonally and everythingly, but the core tenets remain. Mars, teleportation, demons, etc., yeah, but a small plot detail suggests that humanity in this world picked up clues for teleportation from an ancient, forgotten civilization. It's maybe not explicit, but it's pretty clear that they mean the world of the original Doom games. But when Doom 2016 recently came out, it laid everything out on the table pretty clearly. Text in the game suggests that the player character, the so-called Doom Slayer, has been spending some good time in hell laying down some hot lead on hot demons for eons. There are references to the original game, to the end of Doom 64, even the Soul Cube from Doom 3. The ultimate suggestion here is that the Doom Slayer is a force of nature, an equal and opposite power that arises to smash the minions of hell into a bloody pile of giblets every time they arise. So yeah, okay, Doom might not be one for story, but tying two and a half decades worth of games across an eons long story, I still think that's pretty impressive. Number two, the destiny of Destiny's Taken King. At the time of launch, Destiny also might not have been a game that was really great in the plot department. And if you were one of the people desperate enough to search for the game's missing story in the Grimoire cards, you have my condolences. These cards were your handy dandy exposition dumps. Usually games litter these around the game world in the form of journal entries or inexplicably overlong passcode filled audio logs. But Destiny had an idea. What if instead you had to find these in an app for some reason? Half or more of these cards were just a bunch of nonsense words that Bungie probably couldn't pay Peter Dinklage enough to even begin to pretend to care about, but the other half were actually kind of interesting. Specifically the ones about Oryx, the Taken King, the final boss of Destiny's best expansion, um, the Taken King. By the time Oryx finally shows up in the game, he's a real deal baddie, with like a moon-sized battleship and magic powers and like a vast army of disposable goons. He's a villain. But the Grimoire cards hold a fascinating story of the monarch's rise to power and inevitable fall from grace. Oryx, you see, used to be known as Orosh, the princess of a race of weirdo bug people with short lifespans. When her father became dangerously consumed with the prophecy of an impending apocalypse, one of his courtiers instigated a coup out of fear that he'd gone mad. Oresh and her sisters had to get the bug out of Dodge to avoid the guillotine or the giant can of raid or whatever it is that you use to depose bug person royalty. Promising to one day regain the throne, Oresh and her sisters made a deal with some undead worms. And <laughs> I mean, who among us has not made a deal with some undead worms? None of us. She surrendered her soul to the darkness, Destiny's unseen ultimate villain, and transformed into a male named Oryx, imbued with great power, led by the trait of inquisitiveness, and saddled to feed the hunger of the worms. After realizing that the worms had fooled them, and I mean, who among us has not been fooled by some undead worms? Oryx killed his sisters to absorb their power, and killed his own worm, transforming again into a nihilistic space god known as Oryx. 
the Taken King. It's a pretty involved backstory, and I mean, I'm leaving a ton of details out for sake of time, so it's not really surprising that a lot of this didn't actually make it into Destiny proper. But there's a wizard on the moon! Number three, the secret moon base of Warframe. It's entirely possible that you haven't heard of Warframe. It doesn't get a lot of lip service on the internet, but at the same time, it's incredibly popular. The free-to-play action game pits the players, as space ninjas called Tenno, against a slew of brain-damaged clones and bug people. In short, it's every action game. That cost $3,000 to put that text there. I hope you liked it. But beneath that sweet, sweet free-to-play surface, there's actually something kind of interesting going on. The game features a universe where an ancient solar empire used psychics to pilot robot space ninjas in order to fend off an alien invasion. Though they succeeded in defeating their enemy, the Empire fell in the process for reasons that are largely a mystery. Eons later, these Tenno are awoken by a cosmic force called the Lotus to defeat a new threat. And yada yada yada, grinding for loot ensues, you know the scoop, you've played it. <laughs> It's fun. And that's how it went for years, until the game's developer, Digital Extremes, dropped a massive lore bomb on the player base, incinerating them with details, peeling their flesh back with white hot load of story. A late game quest called The Second Dream added to the game full-on cutscenes, dialogue, new characters, basically everything that Warframe typically lacked. And to save you the grind, a whole lot of messed up shit happens. A boss-like enemy called The Stalker tries to blow up Earth's moon. Which is already strange because Earth doesn't have a moon in Warframe. Turns out, that's because the floaty disembodied space voice, the Lotus, hid the moon in a pocket dimension. Because you, the player, were on the moon the entire time. I mean, your actual player character, not you personally. Unless you're playing this on the moon. And if you're watching this video on the moon, hey, that's cool. How'd you get there? The Warframes of the game are revealed to not be skin-tight, highly fashionable Iron Man suits at all, but rather drones that are remotely piloted by children who were tortured, mutated, and enslaved as a last-ditch effort to fend off that alien invasion from the start of the story. And the Lotus? She was an alien present during the invasion, who mind-controlled the Tenno and made them murder their masters. Her own feelings of guilt stopped her, and she put her children to sleep for thousands of years after coming close to annihilating humanity. In a single mission, assumptions players have had for years were turned upside down. The players were never actually present for any mission they played, and the Lotus's good deeds were entirely motivated by guilt. You, as a Tenno, were responsible for the downfall of humanity's great empire. Also, there was a secret base on the moon! Why do all these have to do with the moon? Number four, Dota 2. Dota 2 is the sequel to Defense of the Ancients, which itself was a Warcraft 3 mod that was put together by, like, a gang of actual teenagers. This, along with the vague mishmash of repurposed Warcraft 3 assets, didn't necessarily provide the best basis for an enjoyable, coherent, or otherwise interesting story. And yet, here we are. In making the Valve Dome sequel, a lot of details had to be slopped off from the mod of Blizzard's game including the Defense of the Ancients title, leaving the all uppercase Dota acronym as just Dota. Ancients remain in the game, however. Although they're ostensibly just goalposts, each have their own unique backstory, which probably amounts to Jack for like 99% of the player base. The Warring Ancients, Dire and Radiant, used to be a single entity called the Mad Moon. This hunk of rock was a one-man Big Bang, the primordial mind that existed before all creation. In less elegant terms, it's like a god whose personality was split when the universe was barfed forth into being. Blech. Existence. The two sides, Radiant and Dire, didn't like each other very much, so Zeb, their sibling, pitched them to Earth like a mother dumping an unwanted child at an interstate strip mall discount outlet. In the process, the moon exploded into pieces that fell to Earth like a meteor shower. The big chunks became the Ancients, and Radiant and Dire's energies guided, altered, and otherwise perverted the development of Earth's species and cultures so pervasively that the planet is fundamentally dependent on these two ores. Which brings us to the state of the present in the game's narrative, where societies that had aligned with either ancient faction mutated into the endless waves of NPC creeps in the game. The otherwise strong-willed beings resisted, becoming heroes who draw their powers from the ancients. It's funny, because as I'm saying this aloud, I'm realizing that this is actually the exact same backstory as American football. Number five, The Witcher 3's crazy monster history. Now, I know this might be hard to believe, but CD Projekt Red's Witcher series has got a story. Yeah, a huge one too, like massive. 
So what's the game series doing on this list? Well, sometime a story can become so big that you could lose incredible details within it. And in three huge games, which themselves are sequels to novels and short stories by Polish author Andy Sapkowski, that's exactly what happened. The contents of all three Witcher games follow the events of Sapkowski's stories, which is why you, yeah, you, the person who has been there since the beginning of the game series, since 2007, and endured all the confusing controls and obnoxious fans like me who only came to the series in the third game, might still feel confused about the story. All kinds of names and events are referenced in these that come from the game's source material, but the biggest moment of all is something called the Conjunction of the Spheres. Detail-obsessed players have already spotted enough info within the in-game books to piece this all together, but otherwise information is hard to come by. The games describe the Conjunction as something of a multiversal rat king. The tales of a bunch of parallel universes got tied together in a big knot about 1500 years before the games take place. What resulted was one world, filled with unnatural organisms that should not coexist, including many of the game's monsters. But perhaps most interesting is that these creatures that crossed over included humans. The Dalk and Wazgor are said to have crossed over before their original world was destroyed. And then hundreds of years later, the Nordlings did as well. The implication of this event is huge for witchers, who are meant to be monster killers. What is a monster in a world where things may have come to be in this world only out of random chance? Which, if you think about it, makes Geralt of Rivia like a badass fantasy Greenpeace agent whose goal is preserving ecological harmony. Either that, or maybe he just loves killing stuff. I'm beginning to think he just loves killing stuff.